people. I lose friends constantly. I lost a friend yesterday. Um, she was a, uh, she worked in the treatment industry. She was in recovery. Um, she was loved by many sponsored people um, and she died. They had two little young children. This is our normal. And my father is in recovery and that was my first real exposure to understanding uh, what it meant to, to be addicted to something. And I knew when he was doing well, um, and I would know that when he was struggling, um, and it, it was confusing and it was, it was difficult. You know that we spent so much time and energy and we have much more to go around HIV. But I can tell you the numbers of deaths that we've had in Ohio and in, right here in central Ohio, connected to opiate use disorder and overdose deaths is a magnitude of two or three times the worst years for HIV infection. Two to three times the numbers of deaths that we've had connected to infant mortality. So the magnitude of this crisis is big. When we talk about what our population needs, money is always gonna be at the top, but, but that's like an easy answer. That's like when somebody says, I don't make enough money, what do I do? You tell them to earn more money. That, that's, that's kind of a cop out, it's, it's a throwaway. I think the reason that we don't have enough money and resources is because of the vast misunderstanding our society has. The majority of people in our society aren't drug addicts. They don't know drug addicts. They don't know mentally ill people and they believe these myths. And the biggest myth that they believe is that it's that person's fault. The stigma that surrounds the disease of addiction is something that continues to keep people struggling uh, and suffering. It continues to infect in a very um, covert manner. And it also allows the disease to grow. You know, the closeted behaviors that go along with the disease of use. And so when we look specifically at opioids, I think one of the things we've learned to do in the early beginning was to justify it and say, well, you know, it was a medication that was prescribed and we didn't know how highly addictive it was. And therefore, you know, people kind of came into this disease unknowingly. And I think that's true. But I think how we respond to the disease, we've done consistently for years, um, which has continued to say it's a moral issue, a character flaw, um, a shortcoming. And our job, to me, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, one aspect of our job is to say, we need to treat this like any other chronic condition. Um, and that which you would not do for cancer or high blood pressure or diabetes, you should not do for the disease of addiction. I honestly believe that the question that we should be asking ourselves is, is what we're doing working? Because I gotta tell you, I don't think it is. I'm not picking on the front lines because that's, that's just nonsense. These people are needed. But I do believe that what we as a society are doing is not the best methods because we are separating this out. We're treating one thing. We really need to look at better solutions that are supported long-term. I think that any time that you're um, trying to solve a problem, you need to look at what has a good body of evidence behind it, um, what, has, what has actually worked in other areas, um, even other countries. Canada, the entire country of Canada, loses less people to overdose than this little state of Ohio. And they've recently expanded access to opioid substitution therapy um, where people can access it immediately. They can access it in any regular old doctor's office. They can be stabilized immediately. And they're taking a true public health kind of approach to it. I think the research community can help to um, gather statistics on what is considered normal during the course of an addiction. I think, um, we all kind of have this programmed expectation that somebody's sick and then you treat them and then they're better. And that is not in many ways how addiction works. People might do better in some areas of their life, they might change their thinking and their surroundings, but they can have an event or be triggered by something that takes them back to use. I think researchers can demonstrate through maybe longitudinal studies that this is a normal occurrence to some degree and it's also really important that what happens next, what you do next, makes a different difference in that person's longer term outcome. It has to take a team effort, a team effort of researchers looking at all the different aspects of this as well as listening to the voices of those impacted. 
impacted as far as those with an addiction disorder themselves, their family members, those who are trying very hard in the community to respond and to get ahead of this, those looking at interventions and prevention efforts. So it's many, many different areas of expertise that need to come together to help us understand what really makes a difference in helping us meaningfully address this issue.